All right. We're back in Daniel. You guys remember that's what we're talking about? Daniel. We talked about yesterday, Daniel chapter 1. And <clears throat> review time. I'm going to ask some questions. And if you answer right, you can go to the magical bag of blue candy over there. It's got a bunch of stuff in it. And, uh, you know, just take, a, take some candy. All right. You don't even know what the question is yet. All right, you can answer that question. Just give one thing. What did you, what's one thing you learned yesterday? That's true. All right, go for that. Go get some candy, Bill. All right, that's true. Yeah, they ate vegetables. They got fatter. All right, it's not the Daniel diet. They, it was a miracle of God. Um, who, who, who were the they? Who, who, who are we talking about? I saw your hand first, bud. Yeah, but we need, I need the other three guys, but. Um, <clears throat> Are you telling them? All right, I'll, I'll give that to you. I'll give it to you. Okay, go for it. Um, what was the, the king's name? This is a real easy one. Go for it. I saw your hand. Was, did I see your hand? All right. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar. All right. And um, you get a whole fistful of candy. You guys remember, um, uh, none of you guys are wearing the shirt, so this is good. What is, the, is Chehi's uh, theme verse? Yeah, Jeremiah 17, 7 to 8. Go for it. I'll give it to you. Great. And what's the one thing I wanted you guys to learn yesterday? It, it was, I gave you guys a simple thing. It was, you know, just the, the big idea yesterday. Do you guys remember that at all? Do you guys remember it? No. Real close, though. Anybody? You can even just give me one word if, you, if that'd be easier. Right, I'll give that to you. That's really close. So we talked about trusting in the God who is in control of all things. Right, that's all of Daniel 1. And uh, I'm going to raise the bar this week. Um, a lot of you guys and some of you guys who are twins try to steal candy from me. I saw you yesterday, but that's okay. Um, you... Uh, you guys call me Batman stuff. I, I'll still, I, I will still respond to that thing. But let me tell you, if you want candy now, just give me something you learned throughout the week, something that you're learning throughout the week, and you get even more candy if you can recite Jeremiah 17, 7 to 8. Okay? You just take like a handful. I don't, like if, you, if you can memorize that verse and recite it to me when you see me, big, big... Big lots of candy over there. Just take, just take some, share with your friends. All right? Because one of the things I want you guys to know is Scripture. I want you guys to implant it in your hearts. I want you guys to grow in your faith. And all of your teachers want you to grow in your faith. And, um, and your counselors. All right? Uh, that's one of the main things why we're here, too. So, Daniel chapter 2. Why don't you guys open up to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to jump in to this week. Or this day, not this week. I'm thinking my own youth group. But Daniel chapter 2. And who's familiar with Daniel chapter 2 at all? Anybody familiar with Daniel chapter 2? What's up, bro? What, what's in, what happens in Daniel chapter 2? Um, Boom. All right. You can go get some candy if you want, man. Yeah, that is exactly right. He has this weird, bizarre dream. It's like freaking him out. He does not know what to do at all. He sees like this statue and it's all kinds of different elements and different colors. And he's like, I don't even understand any of this. So we're about to learn what happens. All right. Daniel chapter two. I'm going to read um, just for the sake of time. I only got a, 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 you know, 20, 25 ish minutes with you guys. And I'm going to kind of summarize the chapter, but I'm going to read key parts of the chapter. So I'm going to start in verse one here. Verse one. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. 
His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled, and I need to know the dream. Verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not even a man on earth who can meet the king's demands, for no great and powerful king has has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king has asked is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not even with the flesh. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 25. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and, and thus said to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared that Daniel, declared to Daniel, who was also named Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered to the king and said, No wise man, enchanter, magicians, or astrologers can show, you, show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals all mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in your bed are these. Verse um, 46, chapter 2, verse 46. And then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that the offering and incense be offered to, up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is the God of all gods the, and Lord of all kings and revealer of all mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. And the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. All right. I'm going to pray really quickly and then we're going to jump in. Father, we just thank you for our time together. I pray that uh, um, you just impact our hearts this morning with this word, that you prepare our, our thoughts and our minds and our actions uh, as we meditate on your word and learn from your word um, and that you guide all those things for us for the rest of the day. Fix our minds and our eyes and our hearts on you. In your name. Amen. So we just read that. Everything that we just read, that's kind of just a summary of chapter 2. And as we talked about yesterday, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, right? And he was the most powerful man on the face of the earth. As far as anyone knew, there was no one as powerful as, as King Nebuchadnezzar at all, ever. Think about even just American society. I want you guys to think about the power and the prestige of the president. When you're thinking about like powerful men, uh, give me some things that like who who do you think is like a powerful man? You could say the president. I give you that one. Who who do you think is like the most powerful? Yeah. Well, yeah. That that's true. God is the most powerful. I'm talking about like humans on earth. Who do you think like positions, powers? What's up? Pope. Yeah. Yeah, generally the government. Yeah. Church leaders, yeah. Yeah. What about the guy who owns Amazon? That's true. He's pretty powerful. Yeah, that's true. Bill Gates. Elon Musk. He owns a lot of Dogecoin, that's for sure. The pr yeah, the president. And so all these people... Go ahead. I didn't see your hand. Queen Elizabeth II. Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah, sure. The queen. <clears throat> Think about all those people. Combine all those people into one, and maybe you get to even a third of the power and the prestige and the might that King Nebuchadnezzar wielded. That's the kind of powerful man we're talking about here. All right? <clears throat> He, like the people we know, 
don't really come close. He had an empire. He thought of himself as a god. But as we read and as we just read, what we actually see is that he was very much just a human man. He was reminded of this every night because of his nightmares. You see, guys, the king was having a dream about a big old statue. It was terrifying. It was scary in its appearance. And it says in chapter 2, verses 31 to 32, the head of the image was of fine gold, its chest, of arms, uh, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and clay. He's looking at this thing like, what the heck is this thing? He's just seeing this statue. He's just staring at him in his dream. And so as he continued watching this statue in his dream, this happened. Verses 34 to 35. A stone was cut, cut out by no human hand, and it was struck, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them could be found, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You're like, this is a strange dream, right? And I gotta be honest with you, if I saw this in my dream, I would freak out. And that's exactly what the king was doing. He, he saw this thing and he was like, I need to know what this means. I don't understand anything about this. Do you guys at night sometimes, maybe something that's troubling you during the day, and when the nighttime comes, it seems much bigger than it actually is. I don't know about you, that happens to me. When I encounter something that's really problematic and difficult during the day, it increasingly gets more troublesome for me in my heart and in my mind at night. This is just normal problems during the day. When, he, when he's considering this kind of like statue, it's not a big deal. And then at night, it becomes this looming force. And so when chaotic events, when we think about them and we lie down and, and to sleep, it, they become troublesome. And it's the same thing for Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm about to say something stupid. You guys watch musicals, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Rian's like, yeah, watch musicals all the time. Phantom of the Opera? Yes. It's my favorite musical. Yes. It's the, right? There's no, I'm, I'm sorry. I love Phantom of the Opera. And so, if you guys remember uh, the part of the musical where the Phantom sings, and he says, Nighttime sharpens, heightens each sensation, darkness wakes and stirs imagination. That is what's happening. That is what's happening in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. His imagination is running wild, and he's completely terrified. And I keep saying this, I'm trying to set up for you the reality of the situation, because when he reacts to what's about to happen, you understand why. This is what's happening to the strongest and mightiest man on all the earth, right? He's a scared, tiny little kitten when it comes to this strange statue nightmare but when he's in the face of other men and to kill them and to take them into captivity, he's not scared. So what did he do? He called his best and brightest advisors, sorcerers, magicians, elite wise men. We see that in verse two. He had a simple request for all the people. Tell me what my dream means. If you don't tell me what my dream means and you can't, I will rip your limbs off your body and I'll burn your house down. That's what he actually says. He says, but if you can tell me, I'll pay you handsomely. You'll be, the, you'll be the greatest in all the land. I will make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. I'll give you rewards that you can't even fathom. And he could do it. <clears throat> so what happened was no one could tell him. No one can tell him what it meant at all. The thing that the king has asked is difficult. The wise men that brought, he brought in said as much. They said, who can even tell the king who, who this dream is about? Like, this doesn't make any sense. The, the only people that could tell him are the gods. 
who don't even live with us. <clears throat> and so they were saying, this is a crazy king. He's a cra he's, he's, he lost his mind. Who can, who can do this? This, of course, did not go well with Nebuchadnezzar. And he came through with this promise. He said, you know what, Arioch, that's the guy he put in charge of killing all the wise men in Babylon, kill them, all of them, destroy them, kill them, their families, their households, destroy all of them. Give me a list. I want a list. I wanted to check off the list. And no one is to live. <clears throat> this is troublesome, right? This is, this is crazy. This is crazy, guys, because think about it. No one could tell him his dream. <clears throat> Excuse me. Doc, I think I have to see here or something. <laughs> um, no one could tell him his dream. And then he's like, I'm going to get them all killed. This, this seems kind of ridiculous for us, but I want, I want to bring it into some application for you. Is this not what we do? Think about it. We may not have the ability and the power to get people killed, but when something goes awry in our lives, when something happens in our lives that doesn't really fit what we want to happen, when the things of our life, our plans fall apart, and let me tell you, uh, the past year and a half, year, two years of, like, that we've experienced, I'm sure your family, I'm sure you guys, I'm sure your friends have all experienced this, plans destroyed, fell apart, broken, and what was, what's our first reaction normally? Anger, irrational backlash and behavior. This is what happens, like I said, when fear meets anger. When a terrified king who has all the power that he can wield lashes out irrationally and in anger. So he has all the wise men killed. <clears throat> and so now Daniel is on the scene with his friends. He is unfortunately one of the, some of the wise men that are about to be killed. And so he goes, he talks to his friends, and um, in his own prayers, the Lord reveals to Daniel what the king's dream means. And that's verse 19. Guys, this is kind of like, so Daniel dreams a dream about the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. Exactly right. You took it from me. This is Inception. This was our first Inception. So that, I mean, Christopher Nolan, he, he took this from the Bible. That's <clears throat> this, is, this is Inception, really. And so Daniel runs up to Arioch, the guy who was sent to kill him. But he, go, he actually goes to the guy who has the sword that's going to, like, chop his head off. He says, bro, I know what this means. Take me before the king. And he does. Daniel gets to the king and says, here is what your dream means. You, O king, the king of kings, you are the golden head. Right? This is verse 37 to 38. Of course, the king would love this. He was like, this is great. I love this interpretation. Don't tell me anymore. But he says, another king, another kingdom and another king inferior to you shall rise up after you. And even a third kingdom and even a fourth kingdom. That is what the other pieces of statue mean, the silver, the bronze, the iron. And so this troubles them. Now, a, a well-known understanding of just some of these pieces, um, and I, I'm not going to go beyond these, is that in order from head down, it's understood that the head's Babylon, you know, the chest and the arms are Medo persia Below that is Greece, below that is Rome, and I can't go any further. But that's generally understood as most people would agree with that because that's exactly what happens in your Bibles and in history. All right, who comes after and takes over Babylon? Persia. Who comes after Persia and takes over Persia? Greece. Who comes after them and takes over Greece? Rome. <clears throat> I won't go further than that, but there's a simple thing I want you guys to understand here. It's that... God has no rival. We should have confidence in the God who has no rival. It's He who establishes kingdoms and kings. Even when we don't know what's happening in our own lives, even when you go and you have the, the most uh, ridiculous experiences, 
There is nothing too big for God. He is in charge of all things. He has no rival. And it's because our God has no rival. We have confidence in him. And so this is what Daniel says. The king hears this and he's troubled. And maybe the king's like, you know, this is just one interpretation. I'm going to get this guy killed. Daniel says this. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. It shall stand forever. Just as the king saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand. And, it, and it, that it broke in pieces. The iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. And the dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. That's a powerful statement. And so as we read earlier, the king recognizes who God is. He falls before and, and gives incense up to God and, and gives Daniel like province of Babylon. This is a big deal. This is the same idea we learned yesterday. God is in control and this dream proves it. God will actually replace all kingdoms with his very own. This dream did come true. Because if you know your Bibles in world history, like I said earlier, all these kingdoms came. And Rome took over most of the known world and the known kingdom. And then the, and then the kingdom of God came and started in a back alley barn known as Bethlehem. And a virgin girl gave birth to our Savior. And as we read in Luke chapter 1, 32 to 33, and the, Lord gave, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and will reign over all the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary asked, how would this thing happen? And the angel says to Mary, you guys know what the angel says to Mary? This is the Christmas story. God will do it. God will do it. Guys, the stone is the the stone in the king's dream is Jesus. This is the stone that comes out of nowhere. This is the beginning of God's forever kingdom. They tried to stop this by putting Jesus on the cross and but not even death could stop him. This kingdom will never be stopped. And he comes back and he tells all of his followers into all the earth to share his gospel, telling everyone that his kingdom is here and he's coming back. And this is the kingdom that not just rivals Babylon, but completely destroys America. No borders, no... Far beyond any tribe, nation, and tongue, it includes all peoples of all nations, of all tribes, of all tongues, of all races, of all ethnicities. And then he says, come and make me known to your friends, your family, your, everybody that you come in talk, uh, contact with, your, your teachers, everyone. They couldn't stop him. This is the message that we see here in Daniel that God has no rival so have confidence in God his kingdom knows no end so have an overwhelming confidence of the God who has no end I know you guys are tired but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna end right here with some application for you can I see all faces real quick there we go Here's the application. Look at Daniel's response. He doesn't panic or run away. And likewise, he doesn't let himself just sit there and wait for Ariok to chop his head off. All right? This is what he does. Verses 17 to 18. Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and told them to seek mercy from God, the God of heaven concerning the mystery of the king's dream so that they may not be killed. You're like, what's this have to do with anything? Guys, he prayed. 
He prayed. He had confidence in God that God would give him the wisdom and the knowledge to do the thing that the king was asking him to do. Did you guys get that? He responds so differently than the rest of the wise men at all. When they gave up and said, who can even understand this? Only the gods can. Daniel said, there's one true God and he has the answer. Let's think about this for a second because our society is so much like Babylon. Our culture will look forward to all types of gods. And maybe you do the same. The God of video games, the God of work, the God of individual expression, the God of power, the God of selfishness, whatever it may be. Friends, I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. All right? The world loves that you would pursue those gods. And it hates that you pursue the one true God, Jesus. They would say, pursue your own pleasure and your own happiness and your own truth as long as it's not Jesus. They won't tolerate that. My desire is that you grow in your faith. This sounds discouraging, but it's not meant to be. Because the same God that saved Daniel and his friends from losing their heads by giving them the wisdom they needed is the same God that you and I worship today. The world may come for you, and it will hate you. But in John 15, we, we read this. This isn't a surprise to us. If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. And in the very next chapter, when we also read, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. This is our reality, friends. If God is for us, who can be against us? You are his child. You are an heir to the promise of God and a co-heir with Jesus. We have nothing to fear in the face of an uncertain and hostile world. We have a sweet confidence in God that has no rival. The stone that broke the statue, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So don't panic when things turn up crazy or scary or all out of sorts. And likewise, don't sit there and do nothing but go boldly before God for all that you need. Because all that you need in this life is found in Him and have confidence in the God who has no rival. Thank you.